Welcome to the Pro Hockey Alumni Podcast, the home of behind-the-scenes interviews, stories, and memories that celebrate the heritage of the great game of hockey. The Pro Hockey Alumni Podcast is hosted by Mark Willand. Today's guest is film producer and hockey fan Mark Greshmill, who has produced an entertaining documentary on the California Seals hockey franchise, one of the six expansion teams added to the NHL in 1967. The nine-year NHL saga of the Seals includes everything from white skates and orange pucks to disastrous trades and an out-of-control owner. From future hockey stars like Reggie Leach, Dennis Marouk, and Charlie Simler to a female streaker and a cheerleader named Crazy George. From the creation of the World Hockey Association to a tragic on-ice death. Players that appear in Mark's documentary include Gilles Meloche, Charlie Simmer, Dennis Marouk, Reggie Leach, Gary Suitcase Smith, Walt McKechnie, Burt Marshall, and many more. In addition to the player interviews, the film includes an amazing collection of never-before-seen photos, rare broadcast footage, and home movies and news stories that have not been seen in more than 40 years. Let's talk to Mark about the SEALs documentary. Mark, a tremendous effort, uh, and the, the big question is, I will tell you, first of all, that you and I were at polar opposites of the hockey fandom uh, circuit as kids. I was in the Boston, yes, I was in the Boston area, the Northeast, where, uh, Bob, you were in the Big Bad Bruins. You couldn't get a ticket. If you did, it was behind a pole somewhere. Uh, you were in Oakland, which was uh, perhaps <laughs> uh, hockey was not quite as popular at that point, so... The big question is why you fell in love with the Seals and, and, and enjoyed going to those games. And you know, let me know, our fans know, what the uh, fascination was with the Oakland Seals. Okay, well, it's, it's a, it's, it's a, you know, not, not a long story, but uh, uh, I am actually a transplanted Canadian. And when I was seven, my folks moved from Vancouver to the uh, San Francisco Bay Area. And uh, when I was, uh, I guess I was about nine years old. The uh, the uh, the uh, the NHL expanded from uh, six teams to twelve, and uh, one of those teams played about five miles from my from our house. So they played the Oakland Coliseum. That that was the uh, uh, the California Seals, which later became the Oakland Seals, which later became the California Golden Seals. So we went to a lot of games. The tickets weren't very expensive. I mean, I still have ticket stubs that I show in the documentary and. Uh, you know, we would get tickets for like five dollars, and we, you know, I was fourteen and under, so we get half price. And uh, there weren't a lot of sellouts, so it was never really a problem getting tickets. So um, I went to uh, throughout the nine seasons the Seals played. We went to a lot of games. My dad and my two brothers. Uh, you know, we had a we had a lot of uh, down seasons, a lot of seasons where things started to turn around, and then something you know, like whatever could go wrong seemed to go wrong with that franchise. Yeah. Um, and then later, later when they, they left after nine seasons, and uh, I later became a, uh, a TV um, a news producer, and I worked in television news and then documentaries. I, I made the world a better place by doing shows like uh, Lindsay Lohan, The Road to Jail. Uh, <laughs> but I, I always thought the uh, the SEAL story um, you know, should be told. I had done a couple of news stories about them when I was working TV news, and then I decided, you know, I'm going to try and do this. And... It was a labor of love project. I spent about two years, and I traveled all across North America. I tracked down. I interviewed over 30 former players, uh, team officials, fans. Uh, even got Wayne Gretzky to sit down. You know, uh, we uncovered an incredible amount of footage that has never been seen. We we found old uh, uh, news footage and interviews that had been sitting uh, sitting on a shelf in an archive in the Bay Area since uh, since the 60s and 70s. Uh, so it was incredible footage. People sent me their old Instamatic pictures from games. We have Super 8 film. Uh, you know, it's just, it's just a lot of incredible stuff. It really is. I think that was one of the more fascinating parts of this uh, interesting and fun to watch documentary is some of the footage I've never seen before. In fact, most of it I haven't seen before. And it seemed as if you 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 kind of you know, I, I don't know this. You're you're a producer, but it seemed like you were able to. Uh, sync up some of uh, the audio that was taken during those days and find some of the rare video clips and sync them together. And uh, it was quite impressive. A lot of, uh, you know, I, I would say that the Seals being in Massachusetts, 
the Seals were always kind of like kind of a mysterious team. You'd see them once or twice a year, but the games on the road were always at 11 o'clock uh, our time, and so you often didn't get to see them. And uh, but it was great to see uh, some of that some of that old footage, some some real nice plays. I, it's, particularly, there was a goal by Reggie Leach that I saw in there. Um, and, uh, so that was quite an effort for you to compile all that. And I remember back in your crowd funding start, you had to get clearance from the National Hockey League to use a lot of footage. Was, was that the case? And was the league uh, eventually cooperative with you to, uh, fulfill that for you for the documentary? Yes. Yeah. I had to get permission to use, uh, like show NHL images and all that. And, uh, and, and, uh, broadcast, uh, broadcast game footage. And so I worked with them and, and, uh, uh, you know, got permission and, uh, you know, had a few hoops to jump through, but, uh, they were, they were very fair. You know, they wanted to see the script and they were, I think the initial thing was that the script might've been a little bit, uh, I think they said they, they were worried that it might be a little bit too dark about some of the stuff. And then, but then when they saw the, the rough cut, they, they, they signed off on it. And, and uh, I was very, very glad that they did. And, and, you know, a lot of people were really helpful. In fact, back then, very few of the Seals games were televised. And, you know, it was rare in the Bay Area to see a televised game. Uh, and a lot of the road games weren't uh, televised. I mean, the games uh, in Oakland weren't televised. But Boston, Boston uh, was one of the, the stations that uh, always had TV cameras there. In fact, uh, I got some footage of people uh, at... Um, uh, and I'm, I'm blanking on the name now. I think it was WSBK TV. I think back then. Yes. Uh, and now, now it's uh, uh, New England Sport. Yeah, New England Sportsnet. And they were they were really helpful. They they uh, provided some footage, so we have some uh, some of their footage in the game. They were they were really helpful. Actually, I remember watching your documentary and seeing something rare, which was a game in Oakland where Bob Ewer made a huge mistake on defense, and the uh, Seals yeah, yeah. converted for goal. Those are the type of things you don't see in the yeah. Bruins, Bruins highlight films. It was it was uh, it was uh, very unique to say the least. So you traveled to Canada. Obviously, I'm assuming to get a, a few of the interviews, and you're traveling light. Um, so you're, uh, I'm assuming just taking a camera, a tripod, microphone and getting out there and tell me a little bit about that process, about, uh, the effort it took to, uh, get these things, uh, on the road like that. Yeah, that was, uh, you know, cause I, I, I do work in, you know, in, in the TV business and when we go out and shoot an interview, usually we have a, you know, a camera guy, a lighting guy, or a lighting guy, sound guy, you know, we, we have a crew and this was kind of back to basics, you know, I, I took, uh, I mean, I, I used to shoot news, so I know how to do it, but, you know, small lighting kit, uh, HD camera, you know, a professional camera, uh, you know, and, and an audio gear. And so, uh, some of the guys, you know, I think were a little like, well, when I called them up, you know, there was, well, first thing was, why do you want to do something about the seals, you know? Yes. And then, uh, uh, and then, uh, when I showed up at their house, you know, and, uh, but once, once things started going, they, they all told wonderful, wonderful stories. You know, I mean, I, uh, you'd think a team that lost so many games that the guys would be saying, Oh, I hated my time there, but they all seem to have really fond memories, uh, you know, and not least of which they, they, they all the, which was really pleasant in the, uh, in the wintertime. Uh, and, uh, so they all had great golfing stories, but, you know, it, it was such a unique franchise. Uh, you know, it was, uh, um, you know, uh, one, one gentleman, Brad Kurtzberg, who had written a book about the Seals, he, he called it, uh, this, it this was a, t a franchise where everything that could go wrong did go wrong. You know, they uh, they were picked to finish near the top of the uh, uh, their division when they first started. Uh, you know, they, they had everything from... Uh, you know, white skates to orange pucks. They had a, a crazy owner for a while, Charles Finley. Uh, you had individuals as varied as Bing Crosby, uh, Charles Schultz of Peanuts fame, even Tom Hanks. Uh, even the Hell's Angels were part of their story. Uh, so it was, it was never never a dull moment in their history. And then they, they made so many, so many mistakes that, right sometimes when they were on the verge of becoming a, a really great team or, or a good team, you know, something disastrous would happen. You know, right. from the, uh, the you know the creation of the World Hockey Association, um, and the Seals had just missed the playoffs the year before, and their new owner Charles Finley, who was uh, the owner of the Oakland A's, was known as a very eccentric uh, man. 
he famously said at uh, the opening um, press conference, and that that footage is in the film. He goes, uh, "I don't know the first thing about hockey," and everybody wondered why did he buy a hockey team if he doesn't care about hockey. Um, and then he, uh, you know, introduced the polar bear white ice skates, which made the team a laughing stock. Uh, you know, he had a skating mule at one game. Um, but then he also did some, he did some, uh, you know, pretty innovative things. You know, the Seals were the first team to have their names on their back of their jerseys. Right. And uh, Finley and the Seals, they got a lot of pushback on that because there were some NHL cities that said, hey, you know, uh, if the guys have, the players have their names on their jerseys, then people aren't going to buy programs. And so there were, there, were, there were a couple of cities where the players actually the team had to travel with road jerseys without the names on them because they were worried about the, uh, uh, you know, getting the, the, you know, selling the programs. Uh, Finley was the first time, uh, yeah, the Seals were the first team to actually fly first class. Because back then, all, all the players, I mean, now we, they, they fly private charter, but back then they flew, uh, you know, commercial in coach. And Finley said, look, you know, you guys are going to travel, you know, a lot. You know, you have to go cross country. So when you guys fly cross country, you guys are flying first class, and, I, and they were the first team to do that. Right. I think when I think back of Charlie Finley, it only was underscored in a documentary. He did obviously do a few uh, very positive things, and purchasing the team was one, because who knows what would have happened. But the bottom line was that uh, he comes across that he always did, even in baseball, as a bit of a scoundrel. And certainly as uh, things wound down in his tenure when he sold the team to the National Hockey League, again, it's something else I, I wasn't aware of, uh, the... the uh, the dynamics of the sale of the team to the NHL and how he felt he basically pulled one over on everybody uh, in the end. But um, back when I think of you, I just mentioned something. When I think of the Seals, the prime time of the Seals, 1971-72, and as fate would have it with the franchise, the Upstart World Hockey Association enters the scene. Uh, Charlie Finley is not interested in uh, paying to keep the players in California. So, I mean, you look at the guys that they lost, all in one fell swoop. It's un- it's incredible. Uh, you know, Paul Schmier, Jerry Pinder, Gary Jarrett, Tom Webster, Tommy Williams, uh, Bobby Sheehan, Swoop Carlton. Uh, you lost the heart of the team all in one, one shot, and uh, that really set things yeah. back for the franchise, from which they would never totally recover. Right, nine players. They lost more team, more players than any 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 other NHL team, and a lot of their players uh, made up the uh, made up the backbone of the uh, first uh, WHA uh, All Star team, one of the one of the divisions there. So it was it was a, it was a horrible loss for the team. You know, it was uh, I think uh, Jill Malash, who was the Seals' uh, standout uh, goalie, uh, a, a guy that a lot of people say should have been in the should be in the Hall of Fame yes. now. Absolutely. Um, you know, he, he he described how the team bit the dust after that. And uh, yeah, you mentioned the, uh, the you mentioned Gilles Malosh, and I was thinking about that as I was watching the documentary. How circumstance always plays such a role in the fortune of a of an athlete of a hockey player. And Malosh had he broke in with well, he actually broke in with, with with Chicago, but he had he ended up playing the prime of his career in Montreal, Long Island, or wherever, would certainly be in the Hall of Fame. And he he was such a hero for that team. And obviously, you know, watching the Bruins in those days, there were some days where they, they would just uh, uh, just fire away at the, at the Seals and, and at, most, at the end of a long road trip. And there was Gilles Blanche always keeping the Seals in the game. Great goalie, great guy. And I'm glad you had a chance to talk to him. He came across as very genuine. It seemed like he was... Very enthused to talk about the, his Seals days. He was great, even though I, I kept the. Uh, <laughs> I interviewed him in Montreal, and I had rented a car. I'd driven from Toronto. I'd interviewed Dennis Marucka and Walt McKechnie and some other players. Drove to Montreal, and we were in his house. And I was, uh, I was using my, uh, I was try, uh, using a key fob, and I kept setting off the car alarm in, in his driveway. Oh. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, he forgave me for that. Uh, um, no, no, he was uh, he, you know, he was a very colorful guy, and he, you know, and one of the major points in the in the store in the, in the film is when he made his uh, debut when he was traded. He was only 21 years old. Uh, he, he expected to go to their farm team, and they, his first start was against the Boston Bruins in Boston, 
And I, I still remember this game as a kid because uh, the next day we read in the paper that the Seals had shut out Boston two to nothing. And we go into a great bit of detail of, of that game and how, how dramatic it was for the players and, and the coaches and, 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 and him personally. And, and, uh, and how like the whole hockey world suddenly stood up and and said, "Who is this guy?" It did. It was so, kind of uh, it was, was a momentous occasion. If you're a young Bruins fan at the time, the Bruins seemed infallible, and to not only lose but be shut out by the Seals was was earth shattering for for a young person. So Malash always uh, was memorable as he you know stepped on the the stage and uh, you know produced a shutout. I, another guy you talked to. Had a very interesting career, uh, Charlie Simmer, who he played for the Seals, and I mean, he was just another guy. He, he, I did, again, things I didn't know about how they would call him up, you know, when they when the team was going, playing in Philadelphia or Boston, and then, you know, players, some players would get the Philly flu or whatever. He'd call up Charlie Simmer, and he'd be sent back down again. So he was just an up and down, you know, guy. He didn't care, you know, he didn't think too much about both in. Uh, Oakland and Cleveland, and all of a sudden he gets to Los Angeles, gets on the Triple Crown line, and becomes one of the most productive players of the 1980s. Um, Charlie, obviously, you had a chance to talk to in California. Uh, what are your impressions of him? And uh, again, he seemed to be, uh, just like all these guys, they seem to be really comfortable and, and really enthused to talk about their SEALs experience. Well, you know, uh, well, I actually I interviewed him uh, and Stan, and we were up in, in Calgary because uh, I think uh, Charlie had just come off. Uh, doing, uh, oh. he was doing, I think, color commentary for the uh, the Calgary uh, television games. But uh, no, no, he he was wonderful and uh, uh, you know uh, very polished and he was very analytical. You know, he talked about um, one of his teammates, a guy named Rick Hampton. Uh, the Steels in the seventy four seventy five season, they were they were just they were rebuilding. They were owned by the NHL, and they got their first first round draft choice in a number of years. And they dra- they had third overall, and they drafted a guy named Rick Hampton, a defenseman, and um, and the, and the team kind of pegged him as uh, they promoted him as the next Bobby Orr. And this guy, he was barely 18 years old. He was making all this money, uh, you know. So he had all this pressure on him, and and Charlie, uh, you know, kind of outlined all the problems that you know that uh, Rick had to face, you know, from. From his fellow players, jealous of this fact that this 18-year-old kid was driving a Mercedes Benz, it was making him three times the amount of money that they were, and how the culture in California. So the, the culture in Boston was: you get a good player, a young player, and you 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 help him, you help him uh, get better because it'll make the whole team better. Well, in California, some of the guys were probably jealous and maybe worried that they might lose their jobs with this guy. So. Uh, you know, he was, he was really good at just kind of detailing how uh, the pros and cons and what the situation was. Yeah, and Rick Hampton's situation was not unusual in the 70s. Everybody looking for the next Bobby or the first pick in the 1974 draft by the Washington Capitals, Greg Jolly comes to mind. Uh, Pat Price, who was signed to a huge contract in Vancouver, the WHA. Again, they were looking for that mobile defenseman who could be, quote, unquote, the next Bobby Orr, which, of course, is a futile uh, pursuit. And a guy like Rick Hampton was actually a solid hockey player and, um, you know, uh, the type of guy that had he come in with less fanfare and less pressure, uh, would have settled down to have, uh, he had a pretty good career anyway, but a, guy, a kind of guy who would not be remembered as being a underachiever, but he actually was a, a good, solid player. Um, you had some, um, one guy I haven't heard from in a long time and I haven't uh, seen uh, much of it in recent history is Joey Johnstone, who was the uh, uh, an all-star, I believe, on multiple occasions with the Seals. Right. Uh, right. Highly productive. Yes, yeah. uh, ended up in Chicago, got involved in a, a, a major car accident, and his career ended right. rather abruptly. Uh, talk to me a little bit about uh, your interactions with Joey and his recollections of the Seals. Yeah, no, I went. I went up to Northern Ontario uh, to, to interview him, and, and he, he couldn't have been more gracious, you know. And he he talked about you know a lot of players when they go to California at that time, uh, going to uh, the Seals, they felt that you know they were they would get plenty of ice time, and uh, and that was you know that was his wish. And he rose the ranks really quickly, became a alternate captain, and and he was their captain for I think uh, two or three seasons. 
So, uh, you know, uh, but you know, they, they all, they weren't not, nobody was very keen on, on Charlie Finley. You know, he said, here was a guy, he just wasn't investing in the team's future. Uh, there's one story I interviewed the Seals radio broadcaster, uh, involved Joey Johnson, where they had just lost, I think 10 to nothing in, uh, Toronto and they were on the plane, uh, uh, going to the next city and Joey Johnson goes to the field announcer and says, you know, tomorrow in the, uh, in the San Francisco Chronicle, the headline, oh, and, and was that, during the flight, they had horrible weather and the, the plane was being buffeted around and in the, in the thunderstorm. And so, uh, uh, Joey Johnson goes next to the announcer and says, you know, tomorrow in the San Francisco Chronicle, the headline will be, uh, Seals lose again, uh, you know, shut out 10 nothing by Toronto. Uh, and on the back page in small letters, also wiped out in plane crash. You yes. know, so, uh, so there's a bit of gallows humor that sometimes uh, uh, went around the team, you know, so. You know, speaking of, right, it, it, it was, uh, speaking of that, Mark, I, in reading Brad Kurtzberg's book, uh, I actually wrote, read it met many times. I, I thought it would be very, very interesting. And one of the things that it came away, I came away with the impression of, the common themes throughout is you had a, some good hockey players coming to Oakland at various points. The culture was so negative. Uh, a lot of alcohol, a, you know, a, a lack of discipline. I think guys like Ralph Klassen, you know, young guys coming in. And it just showed the importance of getting a young player in the right situation. For example, you, you, you had a little a, a bit about Guy Lafleur, who obviously could have been the number one pick of the uh, of the Seals, which was traded away to Montreal, which I think was ended up being a great thing for everybody, but not necessarily the Seals. But you wonder if a guy like Lafleur ended up in Oakland with that type of culture. Um, I guess we came away with I think of guys like you know, and they'll admit it, Bobby Sheehan or whomever who were good hockey players, but were prone to be a little bit undisciplined off the ice. And Oakland oh. seems to uh, to be a, a bad mix uh, of those two attributes. Yeah, and a key example of that is Reggie Leach, which right. the Seals got from, from from Boston when they when they traded away uh, Carol Vatane. And because uh, the Seals, their GM at the time was Gary Young, who had uh, was director of scouting with the Boston Bruins before he came to the Seals. Uh, it was actually a pretty brilliant trade, but and Reggie Leach, who was a superstar later on with with the Flyers, but uh, you know Reggie, who, who we interviewed for the film, you know he had some, you know, uh, discipline problems, you know, and the other his teammates, and you know he he admitted himself, you know, he had some drinking issues, and um, you know wasn't very happy with with the uh, with the the leadership uh, in the front office there, so was was very frustrated. Yeah, he was very uh, candid. So, he, was, he was very candid in your documentary, yeah. taking ownership of of that part of it. Um, another guy that you interviewed, uh, I was really surprised and happily, happily surprised to see him on there was another icon from hockey in that era, Tim Ryan. And uh, it oh must yes, have, yeah, it must have been a lot of fun to talk to him. Yes, I did interview him in his house uh, outside of Napa. You know, and uh, uh, he was he was wonderful because he was there. He was the SEALs' first director of uh, publicity, and he talked about the, the the wild first season. And, uh, uh, you know, the Bert Olmsted was the SEALs' uh, first coach. He was a you know, Hall of Fame player who basically forced out the, uh, the, the SEALs' first general manager to take over those duties himself. And um, was a great hockey player himself, but maybe not the best coach. He alienated a lot of the players. You know, locking them in the in the in the dressing room to mull over their uh, you know mistakes, and uh, wound up quitting uh, halfway through the first season in disgust. Um, so you know, Tim told that story. Tim was also uh, uh, one of the three eyewitnesses to the uh, to the Bill Masterton tragedy with the right. uh, uh, the Minnesota North Star player who was killed in a game against the Seals in uh, early 1968. Um, when there, there was a collision, and of course that, that's who the Masterton tr uh, Trophy is named for. So uh, Tim told us uh, the story, and also Burt Marshall, a Seals player, and, and uh, the very, very colorful Gary Suitcase Smith, who was a Seals goalie uh, the first the few seasons. Uh, he was an eyewitness to that as well. 
the team ends up uh, in Cleveland, which was a, a disaster. So, right by by any stretch of California, the thing about California and the seals were they were at least colorful and interesting. In Cleveland, okay. it was uh, it was bad from day one. Rink location, the entire organization, it was a real shame. As a young person, you're a teenager at that point. Um, when you heard the news, the seals were leaving. What was your reaction then? Well, it was so sudden because that last season, the Seals had their best season in, in, in a number of years. They had uh, uh, they had a new player, Dennis Marook, who was who you know I think five foot eight and just uh, became their top scorer. Just ignited excitement around the team, and they just they just missed the playoffs that last season. But but they had they finally had a a, a new owner, a local owner who. Actually, a, a guy, a hotel owner uh, named Mel Swig, who who had wanted to buy the team originally when it went into the NHL, um, and they were supposed to build a brand new arena in San Francisco. So they were playing in Oakland, and their arena was only twelve thousand five hundred seats. So they needed a larger arena, and they had a deal, and that that uh, right before the end of the season, that deal fell through, and uh, the minority owners of the team uh, they convinced. Um, Mel to uh, that they should move to Cleveland. So that happened in the off season. I mean, the hockey cards of the time show uh, they even had they had uh, some of the cards had California seals on them and a little thing uh, now Cleveland Barons. Right. It was so fast, and the players players said they were they were shocked. You know, they had to sell their houses and relocate. And I think Rick Hampton said, they, you know, nothing against Cleveland, but if you had a choice, if you have a choice of where to live in in uh, California or Cleveland, where are you going to pick? You know, so that was, uh, um, so they, they all thought everybody thought they were on the verge of becoming a, uh, a really good hockey team. And that, and that move shattered them because, uh, as you mentioned, the rink was located way outside the city. They had fewer people than they had in Oakland. Uh, I think Rick said one time, sometimes they play and it looked like the only people in the stands were, were the ushers. Right. It certainly looked that way on television. Obviously, I wasn't there personally, but to watch the games on TV. But they, they had lost their panache. The Seals, as you said, had, um, uh, first of all, they brought in from Salt Lake City, uh, Jack Tex Evans, who uh, I worked with for four years with the Hartford Whalers, a great guy, and uh, brought a lot of discipline to the organization. They, the, the league had actually, the league had taken control. They had actually jettison some talent including Reggie Leach however they were able to kind of uh start building back up again with a with a, a solid organization it was a lot I just remember those years the turquoise years being the team actually was like a, it was a solid franchise well coached for the first time and it did look like there was uh and, and now you look at it in retrospect and I'm sure you do with the success of the San Jose Sharks which brings me back to uh, another question I had for you. The very first part of the documentary, you talk about the Cow Palace in San Francisco, the new arena in Oakland, and the decision to place the new expansion team in the NHL in Oakland. Um, and that kind of makes right. sense. Beautiful arena as opposed to the Cow Palace, which was like it sounds. But in, yeah. ret in retrospect... If they had made the decision to go to the start in San Francisco, San Francisco, do you think things would have been different? Yeah, that's that's kind of a big, uh, big uh, topic of discussion with a lot of people. And for people who don't know the layout of the Bay Area, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of spread out. And San Francisco uh, to get there from East, like Oakland and all the most of the people live, you have to cross bridges. So um, there's a psychological thing, like people from the East Bay don't want to cross the bridge into San Francisco and, and vice versa. Uh, the Seals, uh, there was a Western Hockey League team in playing at the Cow Palace, the Seals, that were quite successful, and they had good attendance. But uh, the NHL uh, did not want the team playing there. They wanted them to play in the, in the brand-new arena. And that time, that, that arena was brand spanking new, and it was beautiful. Um, and... Uh, uh, but the thing is, their fan, their their fan base didn't follow them, so that was uh, that was that was a big problem, it, and it took a while. And and there's so many sports in the Bay Area, you know. I I lived in Edmonton for five years, you know, and and uh, you know there they live and die by the uh, by the Oilers, and you know there's also the Eskimos, 
but you know, in the Bay Area, you got the, you know, you got the uh, the Raiders, you got the 49ers, you got the A's, the Giants, you know, the Sanford and Berkeley College. So there are just so many sports competing for the, the sports dollar. Right, uh, Mark I had a couple more questions for you. Um, one, sure. I've, again, I learned a lot, and if hockey fans, I would encourage to watch this documentary because whether you were alive during that era and you were a hockey fan in that era it, it of course that would be interesting for you have a lot of memories and touch tones to that era um however if you are younger it, you learn a lot about the history of the game and i look at the i look at a guy like fred glover who had two uh turns with uh, the seals as a coach and fred was a great american hockey league player one of those guys who just got stuck in the 16 nhl situation where he just couldn't break in but he was a, a terrific hockey player but you talked about or the, the documentary noted the players talked about the practices for the seals which would amount to taking shots on the goalie and then just scrimmaging and it reminds me of how far the game has come from those i guess relatively primitive days where there was literally in, in the seals case Number one, because of the, of the coaching approach. Number two, because of the long road trips. Very little time to prepare and strategize uh, the way the way they do now. Right. I mean, I you know, um, I didn't have time to finish uh, include this in the film, but uh, a year ago, last January, the Sharks had a tribute night for the Seals, and I was walking through the uh, and I was there with a number of the Seals players, and we we're walking through the uh, Sharks offices. And their internet department was larger than the uh, the whole front office staff for the seals back in the in the seventies. You know, it just uh, it, was, it was just amazing. Uh, uh, you know, just the amount of personnel that they run a team now. So uh, yeah, that that was wild. And you mentioned Fred Glover and the practices. You know, the players would joke about he was he was so frustrated that he didn't play in the NHL that he was he would suit up and practice with the team. And he wouldn't. The practice wouldn't stop until he scored a goal. Right. So the players learned pretty quickly to let him let him score. You know, yeah, it's and, kind of like the uh, just, Russian Russian players when they practice when they play with uh, Vladimir Putin. You know, got to get him get make sure he gets his points. Right. Um, uh, and it just you know the stories. You know, you find out what the salaries were back then, and how the guys sometimes you know struggled financially. Uh, and things that the the team would do with with no backing from the owner. Like one one year, the Seals' advertising budget was five thousand dollars. So uh, the team would do things like um, uh, streaking was very big at that time in the seventies, where people <laughs> like like kids would, you know, uh, take all their clothes off and run across the college campus, so kind of like a flash mob. Um, and then they they hired uh, to get publicity. They they hired the girlfriend of the of one of the stick boys to come to a game. And I was actually at this game, um, and she stripped, uh, you know, underneath the stands. And uh, the PR guy told all the photographers there, "Hey, you might want to stand over there. Uh, you know, something might happen at the beginning of the second period." And uh, she came out and uh, wearing just white her skates and skates across the ice, and and uh, we got a lot of publicity for that. And not only do we have a picture of it, uh, uh, someone sent me Super 8 film of her skating across the ice in the nude, and, and that's in the film as well. Yeah, that's incredible. You have to classify that as only in the 70s. And uh, that's, right, why, yeah. that's why I think it's fascinating for young people to, to watch this documentary. You can see things that could never happen now. If they did, it would be a, a worldwide uproar. But at the time, it was you know, just a creative right. way to draw, to draw attention to a team that had a uh, minuscule budget. Um, Mark, right, yeah. yeah. Mark, in the end, uh, first of all, again, as I said earlier, uh, a tremendous documentary, very enjoyable, highly recommend it, and um, it was very, very insightful. You'll learn a lot every every couple of minutes or so. In addition to the entertainment uh, part of this, you do learn a lot, and I consider myself a bit of a hockey historian, especially from that generation, and I certainly learned a lot. You did a great job. The production value was high, and the effort you put into it was significant. So uh, we appreciate that. We encourage everybody to pick up that documentary and get that on iTunes. Um, but, Mark, in the end, uh, it just if you could summarize, in your opinion, what is the legacy of Seals hockey? Well, you know, there was a team with a lot of innovation. 
You know, they were a little, maybe a little bit, some of their ideas were a little bit before their times, like the, like the white skates and the, uh, the names on their jerseys, you know, but, uh, you know, they were, uh, they weren't a great tr- team. Uh, it was, it was kind of a lesson on how not to run a franchise. Uh, but, uh, as Brad Crisberg said, uh, you know, they were, uh, they were never, ever boring. So that's, uh, that's what I remember. Right. And also not boring is this documentary. It's very interesting. Time well spent. Again, Mark, we thank you very much for your time and great in a, a, a great effort putting this together. And uh, we'll be watching it uh, over and over again. In the meantime, we encourage everybody to, again, stop by iTunes and, uh, and order that. It's, it's tremendous. Mark, thanks so much for the time. And uh, we'll look forward to talking to you again soon. Okay, great. Yeah, again, it's the California Golden Seal story, and then we're also on Facebook if you want to check uh, check us out on Facebook. Perfect. Thank you, Mark. Okay, thank you. Take care. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Pro Hockey Alumni Podcast. Be sure to visit us at prohockeyalumni.org. dot